Please file. Good evening. My name is Virginia Cady, and I'm a student project manager at the Clark Forum for Contemporary Issues. On behalf of the Clark Forum and Dickinson College, I would like to welcome you to tonight's event, World War I, The Causes. Tonight's discussion is the first of a two-panel series, World War I Remembered, a Centennial Celebration. The second panel will be held here tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. Known as the Great War, World War I was unprecedented, both in the changes it wrought to the structure of the international system, as well as the number of men who died fighting in it. World War I also highlighted the brutality of modern warfare and the effects such brutality had on both the minds and bodies of soldiers and civilians. Tonight's panel is composed of three experts and a moderator. Craig Nation has served as a professor of strategy at the U.S. Army War College and has been a visiting professor of security studies at Dickinson College since 1996. He specializes in the modern history of the European and Eurasian areas with special emphasis on security affairs and war and peace issues. Michael Nyberg is a professor of history in the Department of National Security and Strategy at the U.S. Army War College. His published work specializes on the First and Second World Wars notably the American and French experiences. Carl Qualls is a professor of history at Dickinson College who specializes in Russian history. His first book, From Ruins to Reconstruction, details the rebuilding of Sevastopol, Ukraine, after World War II. The moderator for tonight's event, Kamal Hawk, is an assistant professor of German at Dickinson College. His research interests include German film, the literature and culture of the German-speaking Alps, and the influence of the Middle East in German culture. At this time, I would like to ask that you please turn off all cell phones and other electronic devices. A question and answer session will follow the discussion, so please hold all questions until then. And now, please join me in welcoming the moderator, Kamal Hawk. Thank you. I'd just like to say this is my first time as a Clark Forum participant, so I'm very excited. Um, we're going to begin, we're going to have a series of, of five questions that we're all going to debate here, and I'm going to actually answer my own question first. And then we're going to begin with uh, what political interests are at stake in the run-up to the war. And as some of you may know, there has been a lot of press surrounding a recent book by Christopher Clark called Sleepwalkers Europe on the Way to War in 1914. And Clark argues that every country, the participant countries, the major powers, all share a lot of the, more of the blame than has traditionally been assigned to them in the run-up to the war for various geopolitical reasons. I'm going to start by saying, I, and I say this as an assistant professor German, it's still Germany's fault. <laughs> um, or at any rate that, or let me, let me rephrase that more politically, that uh, the, the actions of the German empire the, the so-called Second Reich contributed a large and probably the largest portion to the, the beginning of World War I, um, especially in pushing uh, Austria-Hungary to eventually uh, give an ultimatum and then ultimately attack Serbia um, 
including the point that even after Serbia is almost ready to support, uh, almost accept all of the ultimatum, normally you've heard, and, and sorry, Serbia rejects the ultimatum, they actually accept nine or possibly eight of the 10 points. There's only one where they won't let Austro-Hungarian police actually operate within, within Serbia that they reject. The Kaiser Wilhelm II actually says there's no more reason for war. And yet through the machinations of his, of his uh, cabinet and through the machinations of his military staff, um, that message accidentally gets garbled on its way to Vienna and they, they get a different message and um, events take their course. Um, I'd like to ask someone to argue against me and say, no, Clark is right or, or, or say you agree with me. <laughs> Clark is right that, that the blame is more widespread. I mean, clearly, it, this is not something like Pearl Harbor where one day there's a bombing and, and the next day there is a declaration of war in the United States. This is something where, where there are five, approximately five weeks between the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, many people know as the sort of uh, spark, tinder, spark of tinder that started the war or, or led to the events of starting the war, but there's actually five weeks after that assassination till the war begins. Any of you would like to? Well, I, Craig's writing, so I'll take over. Um, I mean, I, I, I think- Let Mike will go first. <laughs> 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 I mean, I think one thing that's important to understand, we think of this as a British, French, German event, but the crisis that starts this, both the long-term and short-term crisis are, are in the Balkans. And I think it's important to understand that to, um, to a great extent, the British and French, maybe to a lesser extent, the Germans and Russians are reacting to what's happening in the Balkans. And, I think one way to understand what happens in July of 1914 is to understand that basic fact, that th this is where I do disagree with Clark. I, I don't think the French or British are driving this. I think they're responding to things that they're seeing. Um, and there's certainly a way that this could have played out where it becomes the third Balkan War rather than the first World War. And in fact, uh, some of the political calculation that's going on in Vienna and Berlin is specifically that the British and French are not involved in this. So you can expect them to act slowly, you can expect them to be worried about domestic affairs. Both Britain and France have things going on at home that um, are clearly distracting them. When you look at the newspapers in July 1914 in Britain and France, they're not talking about the crisis in the Balkans. That's kind of over and done. Uh, they're worried about things that seem more immediate to them. Um, and that's part of the calculus. The, the Austrian and German leaders figure that this will give them a couple of days of action that they would not otherwise have had. So if you're looking for a, a political driver of this, this is what I think Clark does nicely. He begins the book in the Balkans, and that's where this crisis began. So with that, Craig's the real Balkan expert here. Yeah, but I'm not gonna talk about the Balkans. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the, the issue of German responsibility for the First World War um, is muddied considerably by uh, the fact that Germany loses the war. Uh, the Second Reich is destroyed by the war, and then the so-called war guilt clause is imposed upon defeated Germany uh, at Versailles in the post-war settlement in Versailles. It's very much resented. Uh, it's stated very powerfully in one of the more, I think, discussed uh, books concerning the origins of the First World War, Franz Fischer's famous book published in the 1960s, which uh, <coughs> argues that German, Germany wanted War. Germany was, uh, it puts it in, in, in a sort of structural context. This is sort of a classic scenario where ha we have a, a rising power uh, that wants to uh, assert itself, assert its, its let's use the word uh, hegemony, uh, and uses the Balkan crisis as, 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 as an opportunity to do that, the so called blank check presented to, uh, to Austria Hungary. Um, <coughs> and uh, the, the war plans, which are in the book, the Schlieffen Plan, which is a which is a plan for a European war, for waging a European war, it's in in the books. Now, this is the, the Fisher thesis. His book is pub translated into English with the rather anodyne title uh, uh, "Germany's Aims in the First World War." That's the English translation. The German title is "Strike for World Power," <laughs> and uh, that sort of summarizes the. Thesis, it's a structural explanation. This war was in some sense, according to this logic, fatalistically inevitable. Germany could not be constrained. Uh, it, it, it was bound to assert itself, if need be, violently. Uh, now, I wouldn't want to say that that thesis has been refuted. 
by historians. But I think there's something like a consensus in place that it, it, it's not adequate by itself mm -hmm. and that contingent factors must be taken into consideration. Uh, uh, and there are many of them which we can talk about at greater length. I'll just agree. I mean, I, as a historian, I'm never comfortable with monocausal explanations or monocausal blame uh, in this case. Um, I mean, we could simply look to the Austro-Hungarian failure, failures to run their own empire in any sort of a, uh, a humane way. I mean, once they allow the Magyars, the Hungarians, uh, a semblance of autonomy linguistically and otherwise, they open the floodgates for, for other nationalities to start trying to assert their rights. Um, and Franz Ferdinand's uh, executioner um, is just one of those. Um, I mean, in the, in the East, we've got the Russian Empire that's just trying to figure out what they're trying to do, um, trying to protect its little Serb brothers. We have this whole cascading effect of secret uh, diplomacy that nobody knows about, or very few, very few people know about, which only leads to um, a much wider war that I think, as Mike quite rightly put it, could have been contained, um, maybe not relatively easily. Um, but certainly would not have become the great war uh, that we know. And so it's a failure both of, of politicians, but also institutions and new paradigms that are being created in the late 19th and early 20th century, which we'll get into in a little bit. I think that's very true, though, of course. Bismarck, already in the 19th century, does point out as the only way that, that brings everyone in together is a, is a war that starts mm -hmm. in the Balkans, right? A, an event in the Balkans that could bring Russia in and then bring, bring Serbia. Um, since we've been talking about these empires, the British Empire, the French Empire with its extensive overseas holdings, um, Austro-Hungarian Empire, Russian Empire, my, my question for you, Carlos, what, how, what role does this globalism and imperialism play in this and, and in some ways reinforcing and other ways breaking that apart is, is the issue of nationalism? Yeah, well, I, I, I think the, the two go hand in hand. And for me, you know, if we're not going to look at a particular individual or event, um, the rise of global capitalism and competition, and with that, the rise of nationalism, even earlier in the, in the 19th century, um, is at the root of most of this. Um, the map we have behind here is just a, uh, a short indication of how complex East Central Europe is, ethnically and linguistically. Um, and as I, I said earlier, the Austro-Hungarian Austro Empire is a, um, a very confused and complicated multi-ethnic, multi-confessional empire. And further to the east, the Russian Empire is even worse. And then we have the decaying Ottoman Empire at the same time. So those three are dealing with their own problems of holding together these different populations uh, under the banner of a single uh, leader. Um, but when you factor in globalization beginning in the last oh, two decades or the very last decade of the 19th century, it gets even worse because then it brings in the major powers of Western Europe into conflict as well. Um, simply looking at the map of Africa in 1890, um, in which you have 90% um, autonomy, um, that is um, Africans ruling themselves, um, just 10 years later you flip that on its head and only 10% of Africa actually rules over itself, the rest being taken over and controlled by European powers, Belgian, French, German, British, Dutch. Um, and this comes to a head in several cases, the, the Moroccan crises um, between France and Germany, probably the, the most important of those. And then of course we have East Asia and Southeast Asia where this division uh, is going on as well. Um, this is a um, part of capitalism's um, necessary need to compete, look for resources, look for markets, um, but also the European sense of superiority, the, the need to, uh, to civilize others, right? Rudyard Kipling's uh, poem deals quite nicely with this, although from a different uh, place in the world. Um, and so all these things uh, come together at, at the same moment um, as these, the, the, the empires are, are crumbling and capitalism is bringing in greater competition. You then see European countries trying to hold those markets and so they need new technologies, including um, new capacities on the seas to control those lanes of shipping. And so then you have the, the escalation of an arms race, especially naval arms race between Germany and Britain. And so for me, this, this explains a lot of the movement towards the war that we see in the decade or two preceding it. And then as you mentioned, the tinderbox uh, with Franz Ferdinand's uh, assassination um, begins to set all these things in motion. So I think 
had we not had such uh, a hodgepodge of multi-ethnic empires, and had we not had a really uh, fast burst of um, global capitalist ex expansion at this point, uh, we might have seen a very, very different world and a very, very different war. I guess I, I think answered. it's worth noting that the, the so-called Great War was a European war. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a world war in the sense that the Second World War was. But it is not just a European war. Millions of soldiers are marshaled uh, from Africa, from the British Raj, and they fight uh, and die in great numbers on the battlefields of mm -hmm. the First World War. There are fronts in Africa, in the Middle East, in the Caucasus. Uh, it's, it's a war that extends beyond the, our sort of classic image of where the war, what the war is all about, the Western Front in mm -hmm. France and Belgium. I think I would just add, I mean, uh, I think Carl's absolutely right in talking about the intra-European empires, but imperialism as a cause for the war, I, I, don't, I don't put much faith in. I mean, Carl's right that the division of Africa is brutally bad for Africans, but Europeans had figured out a way to divide up the continent so that it was no longer an issue between them. Um, and the Morocco crises that Carl mentioned, 1905 and 1911, both get resolved peacefully exactly because the Europeans knew that something like Morocco was not worth a continental war. Um, so imperialism I, I, is playing in the background. I think Carl's right that it's more important on this map than it is on an international map. Um, and nationalism, you really do see an effort after 1911, after this, this second Morocco crisis, for people to start downplaying the role of nationalism. And what I mean by that is uh, people don't stop seeing themselves as French or British or German, uh, but at the same time, they're, they're on the lookout for what they would have called chauvinism or hypernationalism which is a sense that you know, my, my, my nationality requires me to go and do something against somebody else. And that you see clearly on the decline from the turn of the century moving forward. And at the same time, that very map right there shows very nicely that people had identities beyond just what nation state they were a part of. There were religious identities, political identities um, that kind of undercut nationalism a little bit. So while I, you know, I don't deny the importance of nationalism, I think we can, it's easy to take it too far and it's easy to miss the obvious point that people, especially in an empire like that one, saw themselves in, in very many ways. The imperialist war thesis comes out of the Marxist yeah. playbook. It's mm -hmm. Lenin's argument. I, I sometimes wonder if there are people know who I mean by Lenin, <laughs> uh, Vladimir Ilyich. Not Lenin. John, not John uh, right? And people sort of know he was a bad guy, right? But that's, a, that's about it. He, uh, this, is the, this is the argument put forward by the, the radical left-wing faction, the European Social Democratic, movement, the most influential spokesperson of which I think that's a fair statement becomes uh, Lenin. This is a war occasioned by imperial rivalry between the great powers seeking to divide up the world, imperial, uh, capitalist imperialism, this whole body of literature that develops the, the logic of capitalist imperial, imperialism, Hilferding, Ukar and Luxembourg. Uh, Lenin himself writes this very influential pamphlet, really, uh, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism in 1916. During the war's whole thesis that's developed there, uh, industrial capitalism breaks the bounds, uh, bonds of national markets. It goes in search of, of markets and raw materials outside uh, national boundaries. Mm -hmm. This gives rise to vicious competition for global domination. This is at what, at what lies at the root of the war. It's rather powerful. It becomes a very influential thesis, mm -hmm. whether it's a, a convincing explana explanation or not. We can still debate. Lenin, of course, takes this. He's an extremist. Uh, to an extreme, he argues that this war has nothing to do with national interest whatsoever. Uh, we support the defeat of Russia, our country. Defeatism, it's called. Yeah. And if you notice, Putin, in his speech last week, made reference to, to, to beating the drums for Russian nationalism. Mm -hmm. uh, once upon a time, our leaders uh, called for the defeat of our country. Can you believe it? That's the, that's the way he phrased it. Uh, just last week, in fact. Follow up one, one, one point on, on Mike's uh, notion of the change of nationalism. I think the, the idea of, of uh, a broader nationalism in the 19th century really begins to rear its head at this point in that, you know, the, the um, German unification of whether we should bring in the Austrians, the other Germanics or not, this is back on the table with the, the blank checks and then the pan-Slavic movement of the Russians saying, okay, we have to protect our, our brother Serbs. So that that idea of what a nation is begins to expand. It's, it's, it's co-religionists, co-ethnics, 
to begin to be emerge at least in these two cases um, and I think helps to precipitate some of that conflict because Russia really doesn't have any dog in the fight um, except for their Serb brothers when they begin to mobilize. And one thing we haven't talked about too, too much is, of course, the Ottoman Empire, where you have the same multi-ethnic mm -hmm. grouping, and uh, I guess it's jumping ahead to tomorrow, but I mean, if you look at this map, what, what ends up happening to those ethnic groups in, in the wake of World War I, and, and what happens specifically to the Armenians um, in, in Turkey in World War I, is, is part of a trend of, of seeing a separation of these ethnic groups, where, where maybe these multiple identities that Mike said so nicely are, are starting actually to be more and more simplified in many mm -hmm. ways, and that's a trend we, we've seen through the, the Balkans in the 90s, you know, tragically. Mm -hmm. well, we've been talking a lot about what started the war and how it's been affected, but, um, and, and na the role nationalism may have played. There are people, and, and organizations that really do not want this war to happen and are really working hard to, to stop it. And so my next question is who, who or what is, is out there trying to prevent this from becoming a war and certainly from becoming anything more than a, a limited Balkan conflict? And I'll ask you first, Craig. How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> Two minutes. <No. laughs> um, well, minutes. everyone knows <laughs> that uh, the uh, European anti-war movement, if we can talk about such a thing, is not successful in preventing the outbreak of the First World War. Probably less familiarity about what we mean by European anti-war movement or movement, uh, and, and well, how can we explain this phenomenon? I, I, I would characterize anti-war currents in European politics in uh, generations preceding uh, the First World War in three categories. One would be the attempt to generate a uh, a more robust uh, war convention, a law of war, which is a dynamic in the second half of the 19th century. Not to uh, um, end war, but to uh, reduce the inherent violence uh, and, and humanity of warfare. Uh, <clears throat> and this is given a big impetus by reactions to mid-century wars, the Crimean conflict, which has, among other things, Florence, Night Florence Nightingale, humanitarian care for the wounded, uh, and the, uh, the War of Italian Unification uh, in 1859, which gives rise to Honoré du Nantes and the, and the uh, International <laughs> Red Cross. And it's codified thereafter. We have the Libra Code in 1863, promulgated during our Civil War by the, uh, by the uh, Lincoln administration. Franz Libra was a German-American jurist. It's a very influential attempt to codify a law of war which restrict what is illicit in warfare. It's very influential. We have the Geneva Conventions, the first two Geneva Conventions in uh, 1864. There's a St. Petersburg Declaration in 1869. There's a second Geneva Convention in 1906, which, uh, which uh, uh, address care for wounded, and the second one deals with naval con uh, conflict, uh, uh, care for shipwrecked victims of naval warfare. We have the Hague Conventions of 1899, uh, 1907 very much influenced by the Libra Code. There's a whole body of, this, these are the first major, the, uh, the, the Geneva Convention essentially put together by European states, but the, the uh, <coughs> Hague Conventions, Hague Law, it's, br it's broader. Uh, so there's a body of, let's call it international public law, uh, that seeks to limit the inherent violence of warfare on the table when the First World War breaks out. Um, <coughs> how effective is it? One could argue not very. Uh, the, there's several egregious violations. Uh, the German invasion of Belgium violates the third article of the Hague Convention, which require prior articulation and intention to attack. Uh, there's a, a number of atrocities, the most publicized, the most bandied about are German atrocities in Belgium in the first stage of the war, which violate aspects of the Hague, Con Hague uh, Convention. Naval conventions are grotesquely violated. You have the battle long incidents in 1915 where British ship uh, massacres, shipwrecked uh, survivors, uh, two of them. Uh, you have the Armenian Genocide, the genocide which dares not call, call its name uh, in 1915. Uh, th this is a, a direct violation uh, of uh, many, many things. The, the use of uh, poison gas, which uh, is used by all belligerents throughout the war. 
is a direct violation of fourth article in the Hague Convention. So that's one pillar of what you might call an anti-war current in European political life prior to the First World War. One could argue it doesn't hold up well against the strains of total war. We can talk a little bit more about why that is. Second is pacifist current. Uh, which really comes to life in European political life and American political life after the Napoleonic Wars, the peace societies founded 1815, 1816, New York, Boston, London, uh, Geneva in the 1830. Uh, there is an international peace conference, pacifist conference in London in 1843. Um, <clears throat> pacifism is a diverse phenomenon. It's a, it, it's, it's a movement that's based upon conscience, sometimes upon religious conviction, Christian pacifism. It attracts very prominent European intellectuals, too. In particular, could be mentioned Leo Tolstoy, the Tolstoyan movement. His little book, uh, The Kingdom of God is Within Us, it's entitled. It's a, it's a very powerful, very influential statement of pac a Christian pacif rather idiosyncratic Christian pacifist philosophy. You have Bertha von Suttner, the Austrian uh, countess, who writes in 1889 a... Uh, <clears throat> book called Die Waffen Nieder, Lay Down Your Arms. It's a very, very powerful, also very influential statement. You have the creation of a uh, Nobel Peace Prize in 1896, and uh, Alfred Nobel, inventor of dynamite and his will. Uh, Sutner is the first woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize in 1905. Uh, you have the creation of Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in 1910, so-called business pacifism. It's an inspiring slogan, uh, dead men buy no clothes. <laughs> uh, uh, this is a, an international pacifist movement. Uh, that's a part of the, what I'm calling the European peace current. The third, certainly the most robust and most important, is the international socialist labor movement, uh, which is explicitly inspired by Marxist premises, which views war in something like this imperialist war framework we talked about, which commits itself repeatedly to opposing war, which draws up a ma major uh, statement of principle in 1907 in the Stuttgart Convention, the Stuttgart Protocol on War, um, <clears throat> commits itself to opposing war in effect. We can say more about this. Uh, and then uh, really folds when the war is declared. The, uh, particularly the, uh, the largest and most respected political party uh, in, in the socialist labor movement in the eve of the First World War is the German Social Democratic Labor Party, SPD. Uh, its slogan in the old days under August Bebel is, for this system, not one man and not one penny refuses to vote for war appropriations. But in uh, 4th of August, uh, its faction is called upon to vote for war appropriations. War is now in progress. Party caucus breaks down 78 for 14 against. The uh, tradition is block voting, so there's no notification that there's a minority opposition. The party votes unanimously, as far as the world knows, for uh, war credits. It, 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 it really, in a sense, decapitates the, the, the ability of the uh, an international socialist labor movement to muster uh, a front of resistance. Uh, ma many projects had been offered. I'll come back to that in just one minute. I want to go on too long. The Hugo Hassa, who's the chair, chairperson of the uh, SPD, and, and is in the anti-war faction, has to announce the, uh, the result. And, and he reads a very famous sentence. Wir lassen das eigene Vaterland in der Stunde der Gefahr nicht im Stich. So in, in the hour of danger, we will not leave our own fatherland in the lurch. It's a very definitive, hard statement. It, it's really shocking, given the rhetoric of the movement in the past. Socialist lever, uh, uh, labor movement strikes out as a force for peace. Why does this happen? I, I, I just tell three, uh, three possible answers we might discuss very briefly. Uh, <clears throat> One is the inherent weaknesses of these various movements, the, the in inherent inadequacies of the attempt to this day, uh, one could argue, uh, to generate a, a, a potent and robust war convention that holds under the pressures of armed conflict, holds up under the pressures of armed conflict. Uh, <clears throat> second is uh, repression. Anti-war movements are repressed 
in various ways uh, throughout the war. Uh, pacifists are arrested. In the famous Kiev Dora in England, you know, the Defense of the Realm Act, 8th of August, 1914, first week of the war, uh, which outlaws public opposition to warfare. Bertrand Russell is dismissed from Cambridge University and spends six months in Brixton jail under that, that's one famous example, the way that works. Uh, in the United States, we have uh, Espionage Act, uh, uh, Sabotage Act, one of them is still in the books. Uh, thousands of, of, of American war resistance, no, no conscientious objection to the United States uh, in World War I, thousands of people put, sent to jail, thousands. Many people deported. Uh, people who are not citizens, like Emma Goldman, deported. People who are, Eugene Debs, the socialist uh, leader, uh, has his citizenship revoked and he is deported. So there, there is really depression, uh, repression in, in a place like Germany, or you also have a vivid anti-war movement. Uh, the leaders, Rosa Luxemburg, Karl Liebknecht, are arrested uh, and uh, let out of prison in uh, <coughs> 1918 uh, only to be murdered. That's a factor. Uh, finally, I would, I would point to the confusing circumstances that attend the outbreak of the war itself. Uh, no one knows exactly what is happening. Uh, it sort of breaks like a thunderstorm upon an unsuspecting public. Uh, th there's a rhetoric, rhetoric of national defense. In fact, socialist policy becomes known as socialist defensive. We, we can't leave our fatherland in the lurch. Uh, there's a widespread perception on all sides that the war is going to be a short war. After all, we have these great organizations, these powerful organizations. We're politically influential. Why should we put it all at risk uh, and let everything come tumbling down uh, to resist a dynamic that's going to be over and done within a couple of months? So confusion, the, the uh, uh, lack of clarity, the press is censored, there's no clarity about what exactly is happening even on the front when the war is being fought. The circumstances that attend the outbreak of the war make it very difficult to must lack of leadership uh, at the top, particularly on the socialist side. All of those things come together to make the, uh, the attempt to marshal a, 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 a movement of resistance uh, uh, ineffective. Now this changes as the war goes on, it actually changes rather quickly, but that's another question we can have. I think I would add one more factor that, that every socialist party in Europe, is, as Craig alluded to, they can all make the argument that what they're doing is defensive. So all of the socialist uh, philosophy on war and theory on war that Craig talked about was in reaction to what they would have viewed as a capitalist or imperialist war. So the war they're thinking of is on the model of one of those Morocco crises, or the other big one that's on their mind is the Italian invasion of Libya which they see as completely unprovoked, completely unnecessary. That's the kind of war they have in mind. What happens in 1914, um, first off, in the German case, Russia declares war on Germany or mobilizes for war first. So I think when the German socialists are saying we will not leave our country in the lurch, what they mean is really two things. One, we're not gonna let the Cossacks run through Germany, which is a point that even Western socialists kind of said, okay, you know, there's, a, there's one point at which some of the French socialists say, if we were in their shoes, we would have done the same thing. The second argument that the German socialists make is that socialism, the cause of socialism, um, you're not gonna do it any favors by letting Russia defeat Germany, Russia being the more reactionary of the two. And then in France, you get a very similar argument. The French socialist leader, Jean Jaurès, makes the exact same argument, that we're not doing socialism any favors if we let the Kaiser's army win. So first we'd have to defend the nation, and then once the war is over, we'll figure out who was at fault. Um, and Craig brings up the excellent point about leadership too. Uh, Jean Jaurès is assassinated in Paris on July 31st, 1914, which is the, 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 the far more shocking of the two assassinations for most mm -hmm. Europeans. And it seems to, it, it takes out the most important French socialist mm -hmm. leader and one of the few French socialists who had really thought, one of the few European socialists who had really thought hard and deep about defense issues and about military issues. Um, and when he is assassinated, the French president, Raymond Poincaré, who was no fan of Jean Jaurès, nevertheless, he had talked to Jaurès that day, in fact, the two had spoken. And he said, if Charest had lived, he would have known how to do his duty. In other words, the French socialists understood that this was a defensive war first and foremost. And Charest said something uh, similar to his colleagues right before he was assassinated. You can still eat a meal in yes, the cafe can. in Paris where Charest was assassinated.
31st of July. You can actually sit at the exact same table. And <laughs> the owner of the cafe will tell you what he had for dinner that <laughs> night because it's the, it's the one claim, well, it's two claims to fame. This is actually, it's also the uh, first cafe in Paris where a croissant was made, or at least this is what they claim. <laughs> so it's a very famous Parisian Apocryphal. cafe. It's called the Cafe de la Croissant, if you ever want to go. <laughs> Ted, just really, really briefly. Jaurès, let me just is, say one more thing. Mm. Uh, Jaurès, however, was uh, quite consistent in supporting, uh, socialists need to support national defense. Yeah. He wrote a book, a very influential, interesting, called The New Army, uh, where he talks about, you know, uh, uh, what we, we once upon a time labeled defensive defense as a national security policy. But national defense is something that Jerez insisted was, was necessary to embrace. I think we also need to realize that once war broke out, it's highly gendered that if you were pacifist or socialist and not willing to fight, you were seen as not being masculine. And we see a, a number of socialists in particular, um, not least of all the editor of the Italian socialist newspaper Avanti, one Benito Mussolini, a good socialist at one point, um, deciding that Italy must fight to prove its masculinity. So not just the masculinity and the virility of the individual, but of the country as a whole. And so one had to fight to survive. This isn't part of the rhetoric, or it's a very small part of the rhetoric prior to the war, but at the outbreak, it's a way to test oneself and to prove oneself. And so it's a highly gendered emotion, uh, emotional appeal at the same time. This is another aspect of resistance, the suffrage movement. Remember, women could not vote. No, no women could not vote. Women were accorded the vote in the Scandinavian countries uh, uh, during the war in 1915. But women's suffrage only comes in uh, following the war in, in the United States, in, in Germany, 1917, in Russia. It doesn't come in in uh, France and Italy remarkably until 1946. Mm -hmm. Women could not vote uh, when the war breaks out. There's a powerful suffrage movement, particularly in Britain, it divi and has a pacifist current built into it. But it divi it's divided by the war. It's even like the Pankhurst family, mm -hmm. uh, Emmeline and Christabel, uh, are, are, are pro-national defense. They support conscription campaigns. The, this is used. They, they have this very conscious notion that we, we need to support the state, and the state will reward us. Our cause is emancipation. Uh, re reward us with, uh, with enfranchisement, which, in a sense, is what happened. Uh, Sylvia is, 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 is a socialist uh, uh, and uh, anti-war activist all during, during the war. The families are divided uh, with the way the war, and, and, and but same thing in the United States. You have Jane Addams. She's a very, uh, very outspoken anti-war uh, activist. She's not touched. She's very popular. She's embraced, associated with popular uh, uh, social causes. She's not uh, put on trial uh, uh, as, as other people like her are. But, uh, you know, we have an international social, uh, fe fe feminist, international women's conference for peace and justice. Uh, this is in the pacifist current, convened over a thousand people attending the Hague in March 1915. More would have attended, but it was very hard to get to these conferences. Governments blocked access. Britain would not let British suffragettes go to the Hague to attend the conference, for example. This still exists. It's still an international women's league for peace and justice today. So it's very interesting to see how, and that, that, that feminists really tr struggle with this. You ever read these, they're just, the little mother's letter, widely disseminated in Britain. Uh, uh, British men should know when they go over the top, British women are standing behind them, far behind them. Uh, uh, this was widely disseminated uh, as, as sort of jingoist propaganda, mm -hmm. you know, women stand for the war. We, we just finished talking a lot about politics, and particularly this one political party, the Social Democrats, right, and their reaction to the, to the war uh, throughout the different countries. I'd like to ask you, Mike, what about those people who are outside of sort of the political circles and outside of the, the military elite circles that are making these decisions? What, what sort of reaction are those people having? Yeah, we've been talking around this, but not really talking to it. Um, I wrote a whole book on this, so I'm going to go very light on this. Um, <laughs> there's a tremendous difference between what the political elites are thinking and what the rest of Europe is thinking. Uh, the rest of Europe expects the crisis, such as it is, caused by the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand to follow the pattern of the two Morocco crises that Kamal mentioned. And those two Morocco crises go on for months and months and months, and they're both resolved entirely peacefully. And that's what people are expecting in, in June and July of 1914. When this does turn into a war very, very quickly, within the span of about five days, you can read the memoirs and letters of people in Europe Within about five days, it goes from nothing to worry about to Europe at war. Uh, 
That happens with incredible speed. When that happens, it, it creates a psychological shock that I think it took Europe 70 or 80 years to get past. So it was not just the, the political crisis that's created, it wasn't just the social crisis, it was a real psychological crisis. And I think from that there are two, I guess just two things that I would highlight before I turn it over to, to my colleagues here. The first is just how difficult it was at the end of the war to make peace based on that understanding of a beginning of a war. In other words, there's nothing you can really do for Europe that will explain to them why the war happened, and there's nothing you can really do to Europe to kind of make it better. Um, giving France back Alsace and Lorraine does not make up for 1.2 million dead Frenchmen. It just doesn't. There's nothing Great Britain can do. There's no piece of the imperial pu puzzle that Britain can add that's gonna make that explanation to the average Briton. Um, so th there's that problem. The second problem, and Craig led with it a little while ago, is the issue of, of war guilt. By the time you get to 1919, by the time you get to 1918, the people who are responsible for starting this war are all gone. Some of them are dead, some of them are deposed. The regimes themselves are gone. So the concept of war guilt to a lot of people in Europe just doesn't make any sense. The, the people that you should be blaming, the people that are really responsible, are either dead in exile or just not there. Um, the Archduke of Austria-Hungary dies in 1916, the Kaiser abdicates in 1918, and the, the Dutch won't give him back. Uh, the Tsar of Russia is executed. Um, there's, there's the, the people who are really responsible simply aren't there. So, you know, you didn't have to be of the far right in Germany to look at something like a war guilt clause and say one of two things. Either war guilt is, doesn't make any sense for the people of Germany who were lied to by a regime, or um, as many Germans do, to look at the fact that the, the reason for the German declaration of war is because Russia mobilizes first. So to many Germans, and in fact to many people in France, uh, that aspect of peace just didn't make any sense. Uh, but separating out the actions of a government from the actions of a people proved no easier in 1919 than it, than it does today. I'd like to maybe add something, no, something, <laughs> something different, which is the reaction that, that one sees in, these, in the first days where um, people, there are all these pictures of people in town squares gathering to read the proclamation of war and, and, and cheering and signing up en masse, is uh, particularly, in, at least in Germany, and, and maybe Mike, you know more about this outside of Germany, is very much a, a urban and yeah. middle class slash intelligentsia, um, with notable pacifist exceptions, phenomenon. The rural population is very disturbed and unwilling to go and leave a harvest in the fields. And the rural areas do not by any means show the sort of excitement and what very quickly becomes jingoism of, of the cities. E even in the cities, I yeah, think that yeah. war enthusiasm moment is really limited to a very yeah, short yeah. period of time. Mm -hmm. I mean, most people are really stunned that this has happened. Mm -hmm. Most people can't figure out why it's happened. Um, the, the energy, the driver for all of that really is the fact that every country on that board, with the possible exception of the Russians, can claim that they're doing what they're doing because they're acting in a defensive manner. I mean, France can legitimately say to its people, we're involved in this war because Germany has crossed our borders. The Germans can make the argument that we're involved in this war because Russia has mobilized against us. That that's what's driving this. So I think when you take a careful look at what people are saying in 1914, enthusiasm is, is the wrong word. They're determined, they use words like duty, they use words like sacrifice, they don't use words that indicate enthusiasm. They don't want to do this. They're doing it because they don't feel their state has any choice. Um, and that's different. And that, that to me is, is the better way to look at the early days of the war. I think even Russia could claim that by mobilizing there, they just need extra time to get everyone in place, right? And that it's yeah. not a, I mean, so the, the Russians- even that argument, right? That, that everyone is fighting a defensive war. You know, yeah. the, the Russians, though, I mean, that, that's part of it, but they're also, um, their rhetoric is also about fighting the better fight, right? That, that they, are, they are out for the greater good because they don't have a dog in their fight. They're the ones who are protecting humanity, and they, they have to be, you know, this much older concept of Russia as the third Rome, right? They're, they're the ones that have to save all of humanity. And so rushing into the First World War, they're going to set all this right. Now, of course, the reality is quite different, um, especially as they fare so poorly on the, on the battlefield with all these young peasants, like you talked about, being impressed into the war, not being given guns and shoes and thrown over the top um, simply to absorb German bullets. And you know, it's, it's impossible to prove. I wish I had the sources to prove it, but I think the states whose 1914 myths, if you will, are the least logical are the states that come apart. 
you know, Germany comes apart, Austria comes apart, Russia comes apart, Britain and France hold together. Mm -hmm. And I think it's in part because their understanding of why they're doing what they're doing in 1914 holds through 1918. Mm -hmm. Germany's doesn't, mm -hmm. Austria's doesn't, to a lesser extent, well, not to a lesser extent, Russia's clearly doesn't. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. The Ottoman Empire doesn't. Mm -hmm. Would you like to add anything? Not, not on this I, one. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think one person who, who uh, maybe is surprising to hear this, is uh, reads the situation almost better than anyone else, is this Mr. Lenin we were talking about. He's very consistent. This war has nothing to do with national interests in a larger sense. Uh, it's, a, it, it's a predatory war waged by power mad imperialists. It uh, doesn't matter who wins. The point is that this war is going to create a major uh, socio-political crisis, uh, which revolutionaries can exploit and should prepare to exploit, which is almost exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the most st striking outcomes of the war, we can talk about this tomorrow, is the Russian Revolution. This was written into the Stuttgart Manifesto of 1907, it's actually written in by Lenin, Luxembourg, Yuri Markov, people like this, left radicals in the pre-war international socialist movement. It's stated very explicitly. They write it in. Nobody pays so much attention to it. Uh, socialists should do, I'm paraphrasing, all they can to uh, prevent the war. If they're unsuccessful, they need to utilize the uh, socio-political crisis caused by the war to rouse the people and hasten the abolition of capitalist class rule, unquote. It's rather insightful. He has a sense of what's going to happen, perhaps uh, more finely attuned to realities than others. I think it's, it speaks to the popularity of, of socialism in Europe after the war, that the, the discussion of Lenin and others that the bourgeoisie are simply going to use the proletariat for their own ends, and then who do we have but the peasants and the working class actually dying on the front lines, that resonates with a tremendous number of, of Europeans. And so we see these par parties emerging again, sometimes stronger, a few, few cases weaker after the First World War than, b than before. Lenin is anything but a pacifist, <laughs> anything but. But he's, he's very consistent. If you want to end war, you have to destroy capital. Mm -hmm. as, a, as our last question before we open up the floor to, to you, I'd like to ask, what our discussion tonight might say about causes of, of conflict, either historically or, or in the present day. Um, are there any lessons we can learn from, what was <laughs> from well, World War I? Not, not so much the consequences, but the causes. This is what Craig and I do at the War College. People <laughs> constantly saying to us, what does it all mean? What does it all mean? And I don't know about Craig, but my answer is usually I'm not really sure. Um, <laughs> But I, I guess I would say two things. The, the, the first is the thing that has kept me so interested in this war from the days I first started learning about it. I learned nothing of any substance about this war in high school, nothing of any substance in college, nothing of any substance in graduate school. Uh, but the thing that kept me interested in it is the, 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 the disconnect between what seems like a minor cause, right? I was taught this war started because some archduke gets shot. And then here's the effect. I mean, I think you could argue that in the Middle East we're still dealing with it. We're, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thoroughly convinced now that what you're seeing in the Middle East is the war of the Ottoman succession. We're, mm -hmm. we're still trying to figure out what replaces the Ottoman Empire in that part of the world. So there's obviously some dynamic that, that is, that is um, taking a minor cause and creating this enormous effect. And it's one of the things um, that I think about quite a bit, that when, when wars begin, they're starting dynamics globally that they don't know that they're starting. They don't have any idea that they're starting. We don't have any idea that they're starting. And that's one thing that, that bothers me. Um, the second, I, I don't mean to make 1914 to be a, a paradise. There was conflict, there was problem, um, there were any number of things that, that could have turned the continent uh, violent. But what's striking to me is that most people in 1914, almost as soon as the war began, started looking back and saying, what a world of peace and prosperity we had. And we screwed it up. We, we destroyed that. And I think in some ways, um, I, I'm increasingly convinced that we have to understand the two world wars as one conflict. Um, we may have to understand the two world wars and the Cold War as one conflict. So that the, something that Craig and I deal with all the time when our students talk about this new globalized world, well, I tell my students a lot, and one day maybe they'll believe me, the world was more globalized in 1914 than it is now. We're trying to get back to that level of globalization. 
And when you get to the end of the First World War, there are a lot of people looking back and saying, if we could just somehow reset the clock to 1914, we'd be okay. And when you get, of course, to 1945, nobody is saying, let's set the clock back to 1939. Um, and that's because the world of 1914, for all of its faults, was at least stable. And the world that comes out in 1919 is anything but stable. In 1914, you didn't need a Schengen Accord. There were very few border formalities all, at all inside of Europe. Yeah. I read the histories of the Russian terrorists, and these, these terrorists would flee Russia and end up and take a train to Geneva mm -hmm. uh, without even uh, uh, having to show a document underway you know, if they got across the Russian border. This is the world that was destroyed by the war. I think two lessons that should have been learned but still haven't, uh, perhaps, are one, the need for uh, very robust and powerful international institutions to mediate uh, these type of conflicts. And two, uh, citizens need to stop the knee-jerk reaction to rally behind the flag um, whenever a war breaks out and actually stop and think for a moment whether it's a just war or not. Um, both of these, I think, have, have horribly failed us since 1914. I'd just like to echo Mike. There is certainly in the, in the most, much of the literature, regardless of which, which country you look at, it always has this valedictory mood of the, the, the summer of 1914 being the most wonderful weather and the, this, this uh, deification almost, uh, this apotheosis of, of the summer of 1914 as the, the end of something that, that can never be brought back, right? You, you can't go home. Goodbye to all that, as, as Robert Graves says, right? And he said goodbye to England, but he's also said goodbye to what until then has been Western civilization. And, and we forget that the Belle Epoque was not a Belle Epoque. Right, <laughs> it, was, it, was a, it was a period of, of massive uh, class division, gender division, um, assassinations of presidents and prime ministers and kings and queens. Um, but the horror of the Great War was such that people immediately look, immediately look back and say, oh, what a f wonderful time that was. Yeah. I'd like to thank you and turn things back over to Virginia, who I believe is going to run the question and answer session. Or someone else, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're gonna Another start. Able Clark Forum student. We're gonna start the question and answer session now. Please wait for one of us to bring you the microphone and raise your hand if you have a question. There's a young lady with a Steelers t-shirt on, so she should get priority with her hand up. I guess this is kind of a broad question, but I guess if you were to choose one pre-1914 sort of group to, la to last through the entire war, which, which group do you think would have vastly, uh, would have cha might have changed how the rest of the century played out, basically? We've talked a lot about the socialist parties. I mean, the war, the war breaks some of the socialist parties, as, as Carl pointed out. It forces a lot of people to extremes. Um, I mean, had that not happened, it's hard to know. I mean, as an historian, I'm kind of disinclined to, to, to try to look into crystal balls. Um, because the one thing you learn is that whenever you try to predict something, you end up being wrong. Uh, but you know, the socialist movement was certainly trying to build cross-border connections. It was certainly trying to argue for an alternative to imperialism and argue to an alternative for militarism. And maybe if 1914 doesn't break out, you know, it can set the groundwork to create something a little bit different. I mean, we'll never know, and I'm not sure if that exactly addresses your question, but the socialist parties that come out of the First World War are very different from the ones that, that were there at the beginning. The, the center kind of begins to lose its force, and some go fascist like Mussolini did, some go full communist. And the, that, that kind of center position, which didn't used to be a center position, starts to come apart. I don't know, Carl, you're shaking your head. Maybe. No, no, I, I agree with that. Um, I think one that maybe benefits a little bit um, from that is the, the suffrage movement, like uh, Craig was saying, in that the suffrage movement is really animated by the, the brothers and fathers who are coming back, missing limbs, gassed nearly to death, or absolutely in body bags. Um, and Emily Pankhurst, right, herself not a, uh, a very gentle woman, uh, claiming that, you know, men only got the vote because they went to revolution and war. And so what does the suffrage 
suffragette movement uh, began to do, and they had been doing it to some degree before that, is starting to be much more active and violent in demanding rights uh, for women, um, and especially since they held down the, the home front uh, so, so dramatically during the First World War and then again in the Second World War. I don't think the feminist movement has ever come to terms with the, the issue of war. It's still divisive. Mm -hmm. Is war, you know, in the DNA of men? Is, 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 is it a macho phenomenon that, 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 that's the domain of the, uh, of the, of, 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 of the, you know, macho male? Uh, are feminine, feminine, feminist values anti-war by definition? Or does feminism mean, uh, you know, embracing domains such as warfare, which have been classically a male preserve. I don't think that issue is at all resolved or consensual within the uh, feminist movement today. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's, uh, the war breaks so many things. It breaks so many things. So take these Hague Peace Conferences. Uh, well, that's a dynamic. There's a third Hague Conference scheduled for 1914. First, it's postponed to 1915, then it's canceled altogether. It never happens. The dynamic of this movement is broken or interrupted. Mm -hmm. The socialist movements are shattered by the international social democratic labor movement is shattered by the war uh, by and by the Russian Revolution in consequence of the war. You, you, you come out of the war with the so socialist labor movement divided and, 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 and very hostily divided in two parts, a social de democratic wing and a communist wing. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a very enduring uh, division. Uh, the war breaks almost all of these institutions which you might have hoped could build over time. Yeah, I, would, I would choose something that's less of a group and, and is what one might, might wish. Um, and say the Austro-Hungarian Empire as an example of a multi-ethnic state that while it certainly had its problems at certain times worked in a way that, that we're still struggling with in Europe to see a multi-ethnic mm -hmm. society be unified under, under one banner. Um, and for a while, although every every side, the Germanic dominance had its size, it had its problems, and then the Hungarian treated people on their side of the, the border uh, abominably at times too. You know, there was enough going on there that let, let a very special culture, multi-ethnic culture, flourish in places like Trieste, uh, Trieste or, or or Prague. That that's really hard to to get back. What failures? in diplomacy led to the predisposition of all these countries getting on the bus that said war. There had to be some lack of diplomacy or some um, something blocking the ability of these nations to diplomatically resolve issues. Could you identify some of those for us? Yeah, I mean, the, the diplomats are another most Europeans look at diplomats as, you know, they're kind of strange people, they speak a different language, they do things behind the scenes, but they're generally a force against war. What, what most people see in July 1914, and I would agree, is that the Austro-Hungarians completely changed the rules of diplomacy by issuing that ultimatum, issuing it in a way that's designed to be rejected, and giving it only 48 hours. Mm -hmm. That's not the way the game had traditionally been played. So again, those two Morocco crises I mentioned, I mean, they go on for months and months and months and months. People lose interest, they get bored, they forget about it, it comes back into the news, and then all of a sudden one day we've traded a slice of Congo for a slice of Morocco, everything's fine. The Austro-Hungarians, here's a, here's a document that the Serbs have no choice but to reject, which means now that great power interests are affected, and it's 48 hours. So th th that, this is why we call this, this period the July crisis, not the June crisis. It is not the assassination. It is the delivery of that document. And that is done in such a way uh, to really shock Europeans. I mean, Sergei Sazonov says this, this means war in Europe. Um, Edward Gray, the British foreign minister, says it's the most formidable document I've ever seen delivered from one state to another. Th that, that's the game changer. And that's why so many people, if they're not blaming the Germans for the outbreak of World War I, they blame the Austro-Hungarians. I, I can't think of another example up to this point of a country asking another country or demanding another country to violate its own sovereignty. Yeah. Which is in essence what the what uh, well the the principal article of the ultimatum is saying. And you have two days to make that. Decision. And you have two days <laughs> to decide to let us yeah. march in. Um, yeah. It's it's extraordinary. Well, there were assumptions and decisions, I think, uh, and assumptions affect the way decisions are made. But they're critical decisions that could have been made differently. Mm -hmm. One is the Austrian decision that uh, that Serbia needs to be punished militarily. Uh, the Austrian decision that Serbia needs to be punished militarily. 
Now that's conditioned by circumstances in the Balkans. Remember that the Austro-Hungarian Empire, it's, it's, it's Germanic uh, ruling caste represents about 25% of the population. So it's very concerned with particularly Slavic nationalism inside the boundaries of the empire. It, it makes the decision. This is uh, too much, we, we, we must uh, you know, impose a, an exemplary punishment upon Serbia to break the momentum of, of, of Slavic nationalism inside our boundaries. You could argue this that, you know, out of context a little bit, that the, uh, the, the, the Unionists in the Ottoman Empire make the same kind of decision. Mm -hmm. uh, our empire is falling apart, the S S Slavic Christians are breaking away, the Greeks are breaking away, now the Armenians want to break away. We've got to stop it, or there'll be nothing left. You know, it's a decision conditioned by assumptions. That's one decision. The other is the, the German decision to support the Austrian plan to, to punish Serbia, the famous blank check. Why does Germany make that decision? Uh, sometimes political, and these are not made by diplomats, they're, are, they're dictated to diplomats. Di dipl diplomats just you know, pass on the message. Uh, in this case, you know, the, the Kaiser gets cold feet. Well, can't we uh, do something to step back from the brink? No, Your Majesty, the, 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 there's no alternative. That's the plan. Uh, another decision is the Russian decision to mobilize. That's usually cited as a critical or a, the critical decision. R R Russia does not have to mobilize, but it makes the decision to mobilize in support of Serbia. Uh, the, the Tsar is very ambivalent about it. Well, can we have partial mobilization? Can we mo mobilize against Austria-Hungary but not against Germany? So as not to bring Germany into the picture. Uh, the, the Tsar asked this question, no, your majesty, there is no plan for partial mobilization. So the Russians actually mobilize, and, uh, uh, but, but, but call it partial mobilization, but no one is fooled. The, the whole sequ se sequence of critical decisions based upon assumptions, any one of which seems to me could have been made differently. Mm -hmm. You talk about the contingent sources of the war. Yeah, I would agree with Craig. I don't see this as an inevitable war at all. It's, it's responses to a crisis uh, informed by assumptions, but there's, in my view, there's nothing inevitable about this war at all. And, and one of those assumptions on, on the German side, uh, until very late, when it actually too late, is that Britain will not enter the war, right? right? Mm -hmm. That there is, uh, Bateman Holweg, the, the chancellor, actually is, is shocked when it comes to the point that he's, he's been advocating for this, and when it comes around to, to the fact point that, okay, England will be dragged in, he's, he's uh, sort of shocked at what he himself has helped create. Mm -hmm. one, one point and one question. Um, Carl, you mentioned you don't, um, can't think of another incident like with the ultimatum, but it seems like America made Two ultimatums in the 2000s. I mean, before. Yeah, up to that point. Before, before that. Oh, yeah, no. Uh, I know. Yeah, I mean, I was so NP on NPR talking about that, that yeah, very thing. We've had some <laughs> since, since that, that be, and, and so forth. But um, uh, the old line about Huey Long, the, the uh, demo, um, the demagogic uh, governor of, of Louisiana who was assassinated, and, and, and folks said, well, what would have happened if he hadn't been assassinated? You know, would he have run against FDR and all this stuff? And, and the WAG says, we well, would have been assassinated. And, and that's what I think about with this here is that um, you had the players. If it wasn't this, there would have been some other excuse that would have come along uh, in, in 1915 or 1916 that, uh, would, that would have le led um, uh, a decision maker to, s to decide to go to war. Uh, Here, here's, why, here's why I don't, I don't agree with that. So uh, what are your feelings about whether that's yeah. true or not? <laughs> I have strong <laughs> feelings about that. Um, Here's why I don't agree with that. The assassination creates a very unusual set of circumstances, a very unusual set of circumstances. Austria-Hungary, which had been the big bully on that map, for the first time in anybody's memory is now the victim. They're, they're a victim of what we would today call state-sponsored terrorism. Mm -hmm. So that means, number one, they have freedom to maneuver in a way that they never had before. They also know if they can keep it between Austria and Serbia, which is what they originally hoped to do, then Britain, France, maybe even Russia are not part of the equation. They can keep it limited. They also know, and this is getting back to the blank check, that Germany will look favorably upon them. Germany and Austria have had terrible relationship, even mm -hmm. though they're allies. They had broken off joint staff talks. The Germans had uncovered an entire spy ring inside Austria. If Austria is ever going to go all in, 
put all their chips in the game, this is it. So the, the assassination, although really a relatively minor event, cre it happens at a certain point in time that the Austrians think, if we don't do this now, we may never get these stars to align again. And I think the Germans make the exact same calculus. Mm -hmm. So in answer to the question from the, the, the Steeler fan over there, um, if, if this particular set of circumstances doesn't happen, I could fully envision a scenario where socialism grows, this kind of hyperactive nationalism declines, and then the next crisis is handled in a much more moderate fashion. There's something unique and distinct about this crisis that puts this particular set of circumstances in play. So th th that's why I, I don't think this is an inevitable war. And if, I don't know, the, but the Prime Minister of France gets assassinated in 1916, maybe it amounts to nothing. Just like the dozen assassinations that have happened before. At the same time, uh, it, it would be incorrect to say that uh, any one of these states is unprepared for war. Mm. They're prepared for war. Yes. They have large armies. They have m m cultures of militarism. You know, uh, uh, they have war plans. They have armaments. They have all the paraphernalia required to wa wage war on the scale uh, at which it is waged between 1914 and 1918, uh, more or less in place. So there is a structural foundation that is triggered by this complex series of it's events. Sufficient but not necessary. Yeah, yeah. Mm. There's also that wonderful headline in the Onion, the satirical newspaper from Madison, Wisconsin. Archduke Franz Ferdinand found alive. War not necessary. <laughs> <laughs> so you know that. So that, that's the counterpoint to your Shuey Long. But. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a question for you about the Ottoman Empire. Can you address uh, the Ottomans' uh, entry into the war and particularly? the influence that the uh, SMS Gubin, the SMS uh, Breslau had uh, as they entered uh, Constantinople. That's you, man. <laughs> no, that's not me. <laughs> I don't do military history. <laughs> I mean, I... <laughs> uh, uh, German ships which fi sure. find refuge and, uh, and are adopted by the Ottoman, uh, Ottomans uh, in the first phase of the war. They find refuge in, in uh, uh, Ottoman ports. But I'm not sure that they're, they're, they're a cause for Ottoman entry into the war. No, I, I think that yeah. the, 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 the Unionists, the Unionists are in yeah. power now in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, Enver, the uh, defense minister, Talat, the interior minister, uh, uh, Jamal Pasha, these are the key figures in, in the Union for Progress. The, the, it's the, uh, it's the uh, precipitant of, uh, I guess that's not the right word, but it's the, uh, the uh, <coughs> consequence of the so-called Young Turk movement. These are the Young Turks in power now. Uh, th uh, they have a close association with Germany. Germany is the sponsoring power. Uh, their, 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 their motivation is saving the Ottoman Empire from disintegration. They're, they're strongly motivated in that regards. Uh, they're, they're close military ties, the military dependency, you could even say, uh, upon Germany. It's a very logical choice given who they are mm -hmm. and how they see, them, see themselves in their place in the world and, and, and define their aspirations, it seems to me. There is also a, a fear on their part that Russia's chief war aim is to get the Dardanelles Straits. So if you believe that, then an alliance with Germany makes perfect sense. And this isn't my argument, but it's a conference paper I heard a couple years ago of someone who's been in the Ottoman archives, that their, their principal fear is that Russia's doing what, Russia's pushing this crisis to war so that it has an opportunity to grab the Straits. And Sean McMeekin, a, a, an American historian, has made this same argument from the Russian archives. Mm -hmm. So if that's, the, if that's what the Ottomans are reading, and I, I don't read, I don't, I, don't, I don't work in those archives, but then, a, a, as Craig said, a, a, an alliance with Germany would have been the logical thing to do. And the, I mean, the, throughout the Russian, Russo-Turkish wars uh, throughout the 19th century, this was a, this was a key uh, key component. Who controls the Black Sea? Down to NATO. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. Turkey's you, yeah. You, control, being you, in NATO. you control NATO. You control NATO. You control the Black Sea. You control commerce. You also control a huge swath of military potential at the same time. I knew we'd get around to the Ukrainian crisis if we talked about it. <laughs> <laughs> I just segue into that, Craig. I'm passionate about that. No, um, and, and of course, you know, sometimes we discuss this uh, was a controversial thesis. Uh, one of Russia's war aims is to secure control of the Straits. It's not controversial at all, and it was quite obvious, I think, at the time. There was no uh, a, a tightly kept secret at all about that. It was a Russian aspiration from the age of Catherine the Great. Well, 907. On behalf of the James Joyce Ulysses class that is peppering the audience here, uh, could you speak just very briefly about Ireland and its relation to this conflagration? 
I'm sort of alert to the, the blue in the upper left-hand side there <laughs> and the way in which there's a lot that separates um, national and ethnic and you know colonial lines there. So I didn't color the map, though, Wendy. <laughs> um, and, and I won't speak in stream of consciousness either. Um, the, I mean, this is a huge part. So to go back to the national question, um, many peoples throughout Europe, the Irish included, um, see themselves as a class apart, a religion apart, um, a, a country nation uh, apart, and Ireland certainly part of that. And so as the war begins to uh, come forward, we see uh, more and more calls for independence or autonomy, depending who you're talking about. Um, some overtures from England proper that this might be the right thing to do to, to, to um, uh, establish the free state. But even Churchill, right, who was an advocate, early advocate um, for Irish independence, said, no, no, this isn't the time, right? We need to push this back, you know, past the war. We all need Irish, English, Welsh, Scottish, all need to come in together for the war. And oh, after that, then we'll discuss the real independence movement. And I think that creates a lot of the frustration within uh, the Irish faction that wants uh, independence, is that it's delayed generation after generation after generation, and our boys are being impressed into the service for a country that we don't recognize as being our own. Um, so I don't think it's that terribly different from a lot of other places. Um, I think the, the Czechs in Bohemia would say much the thing about the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, the Greeks in the Ottoman Empire, um, and the, the multitudes within the Russian Empire would feel the same way, that um, one, we already want our independence to some degree, and then, after the war, we have done our bit, much like the women, right, in the suffrage movement. We have done our bit. We now want the payback, right? It's not our fault. We weren't the 50 and 60 year old men who got us into this problem. Let's have some, um, some resolution for ourselves. I'm not sure if that answers or not. One interesting difference, I was just in Ireland this summer, two conferences. One interesting difference is the Irish tried to forget their World War I experience. Yeah, yeah. And they completely wrote it out. And now they are rediscovering it with an amazing fervor. So some of the very best work being done in the First World War is now being done out of Trinity College in mm -hmm. Dublin mm -hmm. and the University of, uh, National, National University of Ireland in Galway out on the west coast of Ireland. And they're rediscovering a wonderful history, mm -hmm. um, as are the Alsatians in France, who also tried to ignore this for a very long time. In a lot of ways, the, the Irish tried to push past it because it was bookended by two greater right. tragedies for them, right? right? That is the wars for independence, and then before that, the, the famine. The, the famine. Right. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the Great War didn't seem as great to them because they, they had that, this terrible suffering on either side of the Great War as well. Yeah. And the, it, no, sorry, the Easter yeah. Rising of 1916 yeah, yeah. Yeah. takes the you know, takes the Irish attention away from the, the war itself uh, and the uncomfortable truth that the vast majority of Irish people um, were upset at first about the rising because mm -hmm. they had relatives fighting sure. with the British Army in France. And those were difficult things to do in the early years of the Free State. Now Ireland can talk about those things mm -hmm. in a way that is producing some really wonderful historical scholarship. I'm a little fuzzy about the history here, but uh, there were incidents where, where uh, Irish rebels were being supplied by German mm -hmm. submarines. Mm -hmm. uh, so that added uh, you know, fire to the whole issue. The logic of the Easter Rebellion seems to me to be quite obvious. I heard an Irish person say it once. You know, we saw perfidious Albion in trouble and thought this is our chance to get at them. Mm -hmm. And attack when they're weak. Well, and this is, you know, that this is, we were talking about Britain being distracted. I mean, just before, just before, like, I mean, days before uh, the July crisis reaches its pinnacle, there had been one of these attempts. Uh, German weapons smuggled, I was just there in Hoth Harbor, this beautiful little town outside Dublin, uh, where I walked for hours trying to find this marker, this stupid marker about this event. Um, it took me hours to find the thing. Uh, but the, the, they, were run, they ran guns the, the, into, into Hoth, Ireland, and then the Irish rebels carried them from Hoth in full view of the police straight into downtown Dublin, and the police didn't do anything about it. And then a couple of days later, they fired into a crowd, uh, a bachelor's walk right across from the Haypenny Bridge in Dublin and killed, I can't remember how many uh, Irishmen. So, I mean... Th there's an expectation among people in Austria and, and Germany that the British simply would not risk getting involved in a war if it's going to produce a civil war in Ireland. I it's a logical thing for them to conclude. It's just wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have time for one more question. Would you say that the conflicts in the Middle East or Ukraine today are similar enough to the Baltics that they could cause a new world war? They could cause a, a new world yeah, war? Do you think the crises today in the in the 
in Ukraine and in the Middle East could possibly uh, let me Let me start with the latter part, Ukraine. Um, Craig and I have been doing a lot of talking about this lately. Uh, I'll keep it short. No. Um, the, the stakes just aren't there for a world war. Um, if Ukraine was a NATO member, things would be different. Um, I think uh, NATO members have more or less put their cards on the table and saying we're not going to intervene militarily, and I, 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 I don't see any reason why they would change their mind, unfortunately, um, or, or fortunately, actually, because I think it would escalate the thing um, dramatically. Um, I think we're at the point where Ukraine's going to stay for quite some time. Um, Putin has, you know, for all his erratic behavior, has been quite consistent since uh, very early in this year that he wants a destabilized Eastern Ukraine, that he control, can control economically and to some degree politically, that he doesn't have to invest in heavily. Um, he sees the tens of billions of dollars that he has to invest in Crimea right now and understands that that is going to be um, hundreds of billions of dollars if he has to do that in Eastern Ukraine and try to hold that territory as well. Um, so one, I don't think Russia is going to go in and take Eastern Ukraine, although the little green men will continue to walk around. Um, and I don't think the West will do much about it. Um, the Middle East, I'm not a specialist on, um, but I don't see any major world war coming out of that either. What lessons can we learn from uh, a reflection on the out outbreak of the First World War? It seems to me you, you can learn, learn the lesson that this kind of complex crisis, which erupts uh, unexpectedly, there's all sorts of dimensions that people don't understand fully, uh, can lead to a dynamic of misperception uh, that can spin out of control and lead to a, a, an expanding conflict that no one really intended or wanted, but that develops a momentum of its own. Now, why couldn't something like that happen in Ukraine? Not necessarily a world war, but a larger conflict born from misperception, uh, 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 incorrect, a faulty judgment, and a, a dynamic of conflict itself. We are now talking about, uh, under the aegis of NATO, persistent presence of military forces right all along the Russian border. Uh, we are having naval exercises in the Black Sea next week. We're going to have exercises on land in Ukraine in a couple of months. In Ukraine, with a war in progress. Uh, we have announcements about arming the Ukrainian government, which is engaged in combat activities, or was up to a few days ago, with uh, uh, armed contingents who we accuse of being, uh, including uh, Russian regular forces. It's virtually, uh, we're at the stage of a proxy war, almost, mm -hmm. almost. Uh, now, 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 why couldn't uh, the, this kind of dynamic of misperception, uh, poor judgment, and the dynamic of conflict lead to an expanded conflict. Seems to me something we should be concerned about. The thing that always gives me pause is when I read people in 1914, they're saying things like, um, these countries are too connected economically, they'll never go to war. Um, we live in a globalized world now, there's no point for war. We live in an age where war is in the past, we're too civilized. Um, we have communications technologies now, we'll never go to war. Um, and of course, all that came apart. Um, I don't remember which pope it was who said, you would be surprised with what little wisdom the world is governed. Um, so in my own little corner of the world, in Craig's little corner of the world, I guess what we try to do is make sure that people understand this history as it was, not as we kind of misremember it. So that hopefully if there are lessons to distill about going slow, making sure you know what you're doing foreign policy wise and, and don't get involved in situations you don't understand, uh, that would be a wonderful thing. I think the key difference is that what we see going on, at least in Russia and Ukraine, is that from the Western side, things are being announced in advance, mm -hmm. right? We don't have the secret diplomacy. I'm going to start with secret diplomacy. We don't have secret treaties um, and a lot of unknowns, th as many unknowns as we did in we, 1914. We don't have secret treaties that we know about. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I think that is something that we have learned much more, is to be much more transparent in our diplomacy and much more public in our, our pronouncements. Whether those pronouncements are accurate and true is another thing entirely. Um, but I don't think, um, I would be surprised if we are surprised. Well, I hope you're right. Yeah. I think you are right. But well, thank I, you. I, I think the risk is there. Yeah. Oh, I think, oh, it's always a risk. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> we'll just continue talking. <laughs> this concludes tonight's program. As a reminder, the series continues tomorrow with another panel on the consequences of World War I. Thank you all for coming.
Well, maybe the question answer phrase is always telling us to see the story. Somebody asked me.